I'm sure she'll be here very soon. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you all for coming this evening. It really is an honour to be chairing this meeting on such an important topic, the fight against Asim Brown's deportation and of course against deportations more widely. We're going to hear from five speakers tonight on the topics and there'll be a chance for a Q&A, more of a discussion at the end. I just want to start by setting the scene and talking about the context in which a seems case is happening. The government's stance on immigration is inhumane, it's brutal, frankly, it's racist. We know that the EHRC found the Home Office to have violated equalities laws by disregarding those warnings about the impact of the hostile environment policy on black people. The Home Office's own independent view of the Windrush scandal even found that it was oblivious to the racist assumptions and systems that it operates. We saw that detention action found that black people are detained significantly longer than white people inside the immigration detention system. So what we're dealing with is an immigration system that is institutionally racist. And a seems case is another example of this. And we're very honored this evening to be joined by Joan Brown, a seems mother who has been fighting relentlessly for justice for a seam in that wider context of justice for all people who have been brutalized by our country's immigration system. A seems story, you can't hear it and it not resonate with you and shock you because a seam could really be anyone's son or brother, he reminds me a lot of my own brother, um, anyone's nephew. He came to this country when he was four years old. He grew up here. He is just as British as you or I. He doesn't call any other country home because this is his home. But because he came to this country when he was four, which is pretty much before his memory, he can be cruelly and unjustly deported. And this is happening time and time again to young black men who have been through our criminal justice system. Joan will tell you in a seems case that he was convicted of um, a non-violent offence. And even despite several eyewitnesses who contested the facts and said that he, he didn't take part in that offence, he served his time in prison and now an autistic young black man who has been failed by a whole myriad of institutions in this country from education to social care and then finally the criminal justice system and um, the home office. So I'm going to hand over now to our panel. We've firstly got Joan, who is Asim's mother, and Joan is an absolute powerhouse, and I can't wait for you to all listen to her speak. Um, then we've got Becky Crocker, who's an RMT union activist. Is Upsana? Upsana's not quite here yet, but we will be joined by Upsana Begum, who's the Labour MP for Poplar and Limehouse. We've got Emma Jones on the call, the Labour Campaign for Free Movement Steering Committee. Well, not just on her own, but one of many members of the Labour Campaign for Free Movement Steering Committee. And then just lastly, we've got Luke de Narona. I really hope that I've got your name right, Luke, and that I haven't butchered it. Um, but Luke is a lecturer in the Sarah Parker Richmond um, Remen Centre at UCL, and he writes on issues of immigration control and racism. I want to give a plug to his recent book, 
deporting black Britons, Portraits of Deportation to Jamaica, which was published in September last year. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our speakers. We're going to keep a strict time limit of about eight to 10 minutes to each speaker so that there's enough time for a QA. and a And then um, right at the end, after questions and comments, if we have time, I'll give a couple of minutes to each speaker to sum up. Okay, over to you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nadia, and thanks for having me. And uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Joan Martin, and you know, some may know about Zim case and some may not, but because of time, I'll just give a little sn snippet of what his case is about. My son Asim and our family has continued to be failed by all the services um, that should have protected him and supported us with our vul vulnerable autistic son, which is emotional intelligence um, of a child. They imprisoned him, imprisoned him for a crime he and the victim friend said he did not do. He was abused in prison, deprived of timely medical care, and yet they are still tightening the screw by threatening to deport him. Not only, you know, do we believe it to have been a miscarriage of justice, we know it is. And we are very concerned about the role giant enterprise, you know, had played in this conviction. We know that that has played a role in the conviction. Um, Asim is now 22 years old and has been living nonstop in the UK since age four, having no one or no connection in Jamaica. He's autistic learning disabled, suffer with PTSD, and also he has a heart condition, which I strongly believe was brought on because of the large doses, dosage, dosage of psychiatric drugs that was administered to an autistic child who could not, you know, he could not communicate or say, no, they are making me heal. Even, you know, ever since the same was incarcerated, I have been saddened by the appalling, insensitive, and bullying way he had been treated. I have been at my wit ends trying to communicate to the prison officer in charge to explain to them the medical and psychological condition of my son, who at the time, Though biologically he was 21, in, in psychologically and emotionally, he was significantly much younger than his physical age. Osim was not accommodated in school. Firstly, because of his autistic um, behavior, he was seen as defiant and disruptive black boy, even though he was evaluated and they strongly worded they are finding that they believe he was autistic and significantly below his peers cognitively. More recently, uh, due to the constant stress and, and trauma placed upon him, he collapsed on the 15th of the 1st, 2021, um, two weeks ago. I almost lost him. And to make matters worse, the par paramedic could not find any medical records for Osim on the NHS register. Knowing he had a heart device and had been admitted to us several hospitals whilst in prison. No history of my son could be found in their system. I traveled with him to the hospital and I was faced with the same historic, you know, challenges that were not, there were no ECG to compare with the one he just had, no information on his diagnosis. 
it made me wonder if I was not at hand, what would have happened to my son? Oh boy. I had very limited knowledge of some of the, the question the medical team were asking me because I, I was never told anything, even as his legal guardian. When my son was admitted in hospital previously, I was told by one of the staff nurses that the governor at Stackham gave instruction that I should not be given any information in regards to my son. I had a number, number for the ward he was admitted on whilst he was incarcerated. So I called them to get some information so that my son could be seen to, but they refused to speak with me. The, the, the triage nurse took the phone and spoke to the lady who in turn replied. We were told that any information given should be doctor to doctor. That was how he was treated whilst he was in hospital on the 15th. I was ignored for years throughout his entire school life. And sadly, I have continued to observe his negative treatment by those who have powered over his destiny and outcome. My son, happiness and safety means all the world to me and his entire family in the UK. I have never stopped fighting for my son. Even when he was illegally snatched from a stable environment with us in a loving and caring home, the undue stress has brought me to the point of depression and anxiety. I was also battling with an aneurysm that nearly took my life. I cried because of the tragedy and the injustice that had befallen him. But I am also overwhelmed by the support that I am receiving from some old and some very precious new friends and supporters. I now have some moments of great joy because I feel like the world, the whole world is fighting alongside me to help us to get some respite to breathe and have hope for some good outcome. My family and I are so touched and moved by your generous support. You are so far away and yet your, your hearts, thoughts and physical presence have joined with us to cry out for justice and to stand up for one who cannot stand for himself. You all have given me energy. May God bless you all for such a demonstration of the common love and bond that exists between us. As we seek for justice, for those that are not aware of us in story, as advocates, your support is valuable in promoting his case. More information can be found on Twitter and Freya Seam Brown, Facebook, Freya Seam Brown, and Instagram, Justice for a Seam Brown. We, are all way, we also have a petition that was created by Hema Dormier and that is at an unprecedented level with over 347 followers. Thank you for listening to me today and let us continue to fight because we will win. Thank you so much. Joan, thank you so much. I'm, I'm pretty speechless after that. There, there wasn't anything for me to add. Your words were so powerful and moving and I want you to know that every single one of us on this call stands with you and with Asim and your family in total solidarity and that we're, we're with you in your fight for justice and we won't rest until justice for Asim and for so many others like him has been served. And please do follow um, Asim's social media campaign pages which Elena has posted in the chat. I'm next gonna hand over to Becky Crocker, who is an activist from the RMT union. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was incredibly moving. 
and um, yeah, just my solidarity. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to hear that, but really important. And um, yeah, thank you very, very much. So I'm going to sort of go back in time a little bit to some cam campaigns I was involved in around about 2006 to 2009, I reckon. Um, I'm doing this because I think back then the campaigns I was involved in, in a bit of a different time under new Labour, uh, not under a Conservative government before Brexit was a real threat, um, sort of illustrate some of the quite long background that we've got to all the anti-deportation work that we still need to do today. Um, and there were some important less, lessons in the struggles that I was involved in at the time, I think. I think crucially at the time, um, the struggle I was involved in mostly um, was uh, when the underground, underground cleaners went on strike. So cleaners uh, on London Underground went on strike for a living wage, but then they found themselves um, falling on the wrong side of immigration law and several of them were subject to deportation as a result of going on strike and the way that deportation was used um, to kind of curb the strike and, and repress the workers. So there was quite a lesson at the time in, um, in how in, embedded uh, migrants' rights and um, labour rights are. That if, you, if you want to organise uh, migrant workers effectively, we also need to have a strategy to take on um, immigration law, detention and deportations. So, as I said, back then in uh, 2008 sort of time, um, New Labour was still in power, but uh, there was still plenty to be fighting. Um, Blair had gone further than previous governments in uh, introducing restrictionist legislation. He'd ramped up the use of detention, built two new immigration detention centres, uh, Oakington and Yarlswood, um, had brought in a raft of criminal offences directed against people who arrived without documents. He was deporting people, uh, refugees, to war-torn Iraq. And he also removed rights from asylum seekers in a number of ways. Uh, one particularly grotesque way uh, was that failed, so failed asylum-seeking families who did not leave could be broken up and their children taken into care. So the whole prop policy was kind of dubbed as a kind of managed migration, which didn't pull up the borders completely, but let people in on the basis of what was needed or felt to be the priority of the capitalist economy at the time, and the kind of human rights of, of migrant workers and immigrant families were just completely out of the picture. Uh, this left undocumented migrant workers very vulnerable um, you'll probably remember there was a brutal example uh, in Morecambe Bay in 2004 when 23 undocumented Chinese workers died picking cockles on the sands in Morecambe Bay. And being without papers, it just meant that they'd been, it'd been almost impossible for them to speak out against unsafe treatment. Um, and that was just one example of, of many cases. Uh, but nonetheless, Migrant workers were attempting to organise. There were several campaigns for the living wage. Uh, the TNG had quite a high profile justice for cleaners campaign. And as I said, I was sort of involved um, in supporting cleaners on the underground to take strike action. Um, I worked on London Underground at the time um, uh, and worked closely with my cleaning colleagues there. So, um, yeah, during this time also, I was involved in several campaigns that kind of came together. They, they sort of started off as um, migrants' rights campaigns, campaigns like No One Is Illegal, um, but then over that period kind of moved into making links with the workers' movement and really trying to make the point that effective organisation of precarious workers had to go hand in hand with um, campaigns to challenge immigration controls because so many um, precarious workers were, were vulnerable because of their immigration status. Uh, and we took that argument into the trade union movement. So I'm going to talk about a couple of highlights, which were good. Um, in 2006, um, we were involved in organising a march for migrants' rights through South London. I'm going to try and pull up a picture. 
Um, and this, about 500 people attended in South London, which was felt to be quite a good result because, um, you know, it was still quite a, a niche cause at the time to be calling for no one is illegal and no deportations. I don't know if you can see my screen, but there's a few pictures there of, of the march. Um, and the good thing was that it, um, it went through South London, so very much through some of the communities where migrant workers were living and were vulnerable. Um, we had people from the Congo, Rwanda, Bolivia, Iraq and Iran marching with us, as well as uh, delegations from uh, the GMB sex workers branch, a large RMT contingent and organisations like No Borders and um, Iraqi Refugee uh, Action as well. Uh, the next thing we did was we um, organised in early 2007, I don't know if you can see that, um, at the first conference um, for workers against immigration controls, and that was very much themed around uh, this pamphlet, um, which is written partly uh, by Dave Landau, who I think is in the audience, and that was very much about um, trade unionists using their power to defy immigration law where they can, um, especially um, in situations where workers themselves are kind of responsible as part of their jobs for policing uh, immigration law, such as social workers, teachers, health workers, having to kind of check on people's immigration status when they're, when they're giving services. And there was one really good example from that, um, where a speaker from Bol Bolton Unison Branch uh, talked about how they organised to defy um, the immigration law by refusing to take children of undocumented migrants into care. So, it, I mean, these examples are few and far between, but it still shows that things can be done. Um, stop sharing for a second. Um, there was also a second conference of trade unions against immigration controls, um, and that went on to form a campaign that we called CAPE, or the Campaign Against Immigration Controls. And the aim of this group was to build resistance to workplace immigration raids and paper checks, and to show solidarity with migrant workers organising. Uh, straight away, the new group was put to the test, because around about the same time, in early 2008, New Labour introduced a new law, uh, which increased the power of employers to police immigration status. This was also at the same time as it brought in a points-based system for immigration. And all during 2008, employers were using these new laws as a tool to crack down on migrant workers organising. So I saw a particular example of this in June, July 2008, when the cleaners that I'd been helping to organise in the RMT on the underground went on strike for a living wage. It was a very inspiring strike. It was the first time in this country, as far as we know, but mostly migrant workers, and a lot of them were undocumented, had taken strike action on a large scale. And um, in many ways, the strike was solid, well supported, uh, and it won its main demand, the living wage, although it didn't win a lot of other things it was hoping to achieve. So it was a, a victory by a group of workers who a lot of people had said were too vulnerable to be organised. But Immediately after, it didn't take long for the crackdown to begin. In the run-up to the strike, the cleaning companies had already been using the new laws introduced earlier that year, checking immigration status and intimidating cleaners. And in the aftermath of the strike, they ramped that up. Um, you know, these cleaners have been working with the same paperwork for seven or eight years, even longer. And as long as they were accepting their exploitation and just doing what the employer said, the employers were turning a blind eye. But when the cleaners began to organise and stand up for themselves, that's when the companies suddenly started questioning their right to work. Shortly after the strike, three cleaners employed by one of the cleaning companies were met by immigration officers when they turned up for work. Two were deported back to Nigeria and the Congo, and another was detained awaiting deportation to Sierra Leone. The cleaning company insisted that they were only cooperating with the Home Office who had contacted them, but we were all asking questions, why now? Why shortly after the strike? Um, and then in the weeks following the strike, hundreds of cleaners were called to cleaning company offices 
and questioned about their national insurance numbers, many were suspended without pay, i.e. sacked, and others sim simply stopped coming to work out of fear. It took only a short time for our union membership that we've built up over nearly a decade uh, to be weakened significantly. So we had the campaign against immigration controls, we had support from within the RMT, and we tried to use this as an opportunity to organise. Some of the best things we did was direct action at cleaning company offices. On the days that cleaners were called to, to come and present their papers, we tried to obstruct that, obstructing the lobbies of these buildings and so on. We tried to get legal advice, seeing whether it was possible to, to use any legal challenge to, to what the bosses were doing. Unfortunately, the legal advice we got was that a worker may have been paying national insurance or whatever, but if they were not technically legal, then they didn't have a legal employment contract. So you can't raise any kind of uh, grievance through employment law for somebody who does not, as far as the, the country is concerned, um, legally have an, a contract of employment in this country. So we looked at all different avenues. Um, we, we put together what we called a checks and raids strategy group, trying to think of different ways that we could we could come up with strategies to, to, to tackle this. It wasn't just happening on the underground, it was happening in a whole series of different um, industries as well, generally where um, workers were getting organised. Um, I've been thinking about it and thinking about what we achieved and I would say that I think we did some very good work in just making the, the connection between workers organising and migrants' rights just having to go hand in hand. You know, unions need a strategy about how to deal with immigration controls if they're going to take on organising migrant workers when they know that um, these issues are in the background. Um, I think we were doing it in, even back then, a racist climate against migrants. Um, and so getting these arguments raised within the trade union movement was difficult. And I think we did make some strides you know, the second um, Trade Unions Against Immigration Controls conference we had, um, had nearly 200 people at it, and most of them were um, representatives from the labour movement. So that felt like quite an achievement. Um, I think we reached barriers in terms of, you know, tackling people's races and tackling the trade union bureaucracy, who I think were a bit nervous about tackling the idea of, of organising migrant workers and uh, particularly organising to defy immigration restrictions. And um, the anti-union laws themselves are a huge barrier, you know. They prevent workers from taking action in solidarity with workers who don't share the same workplace grievance. They, they prevent um, strikes over any political issue. So they're a real limiter on solidarity between workers. And um, to be honest, we just on the underground, although we were well unionised, weren't well unionised enough to be able to take a kind of any sort of unofficial industrial action in solidarity with the cleaners who were facing these immigration checks. So, you know, that was a limit in itself. But I sort of hope that at least talking about this stuff as we go into Brexit, post Brexit, um, and thinking about what migrant workers are going to be facing in the next months and years, um, will at least be able to use some of these lessons as kind of starting points for thinking about strategy going forward. I read something yesterday which said that there's a lot of uh, European migrant workers who haven't yet registered for um, the scheme to be able to remain in this country and they could find themselves falling on the wrong side of immigration law very soon and I think the union movement needs to be ready to defend those people um, yeah, and it's just something that we, we need to be thinking about. So thank you very much for your time. Hear, hear, Becky. And what inspiring and incredible organising work that you've done. And a, a reminder that this is not a new problem, that it's a problem that has existed for well over a decade, but has got worse since um, the, the Tory government's um, hostile environment policy and you just expertly explained why migrants rights and workers rights are inextricably linked they're one and the same they can't be 
divorced from each other and the right to move freely is in itself a worker's right. So thank you so much for that, Becky. Next, I'm going to move on to Emma Jones, who's a member of the Labour Campaign for Free Movement Steering Committee. Just a reminder that the um, time limit will be eight to 10 minutes for speeches. So we've got plenty of time for questions afterwards. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Nadia, and thanks to all the British speakers. Um, so this is just, um, I wanted to begin with, with the line um, that actually Britain has a, a bad history of expelling people. And it feels necessary to start with that because very often you hear the opposite. You hear that we have a proud history of, of welcoming people to this country. Um, and sometimes those who say this um, say it with good intentions. Um, that they may be in trying to do something called positive reinforcement. But actually, I think it contributes to a quite a dangerous narrative. And um, particularly for those of us who have never been illegalized or, or racialized, we can grow up with an idea of our country that is um, really little more than a, than a myth. Um, and I, I'm, I'm speaking, we're all speaking on Holocaust Memorial Day today. And one of the um, cases I was reading about just before coming in today to this was um, a case of two young Jewish refugees in 1939 um, who, who crossed the channel in a small boat. Their names were Walter Altman and uh, Gunter Mann and they came here, they were shipwrecked and rescued and they gave interviews to the press and the press was quite sympathetic to them and they, they said um, via an interpreter I think that they, their, their fate depended on the generosity of the English people and sadly, um, very sadly, they were deported a few days later. Um, and it was a cold bureaucratic reason given. They had permits to remain in Belgium until the 31st of August. They were terrified. Um, they knew people were being returned from Belgium to Nazi Germany. And heartbreakingly, they, they burst into tears on hearing they were going to be deported. And I think uh, both of them then went on to perish um, in the camps. And the awful thing about that, I mean, it's so it's such an awful story. Um, it, it is part of our history that we just don't we just don't talk about. Um, we, we might talk about the the, the the brave exceptions, the heroic exceptions to the people who um, campaigned to get a, a small number of people saved. Um, and, and it's always been the case, I think, that um, people can be better than their governments, but, but governments can be appalling and British governments have been appalling. We've been very, very cold to, to, from, towards migrants for a very, very long time. Goes right back to the Aliens Act, 1905, maybe before. And the Labour movement, I think the, the tiny POP as it was in 1905 was split over the Aliens Act. The Labour movement has a chequered history. There have been instances of solidarity. There have also been instances of the reverse. So we've got to think about that. We've got to think about these cases um, in the context of that history. We've got to think about why people are being deported today, the many, many categories of people um, um, non-citizens who are eligible for deportation. We've heard um, heartbreakingly about Asim's case fr from Joan. We've heard from Becky about uh, deportation being used against striking workers. Um, I think Becky mentioned also that the case of former child asylum seekers, thousands of whom have been deported in recent years to some of the world's most dangerous countries. We're talking here about teenagers, um, 18, 19, being returned to Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Libya, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, countries to which foreign office uh, advice says you shouldn't travel. You're not, it's not safe for you to travel to these countries, but it's safe for these young people to be sent there. Um, we had... Um, I've all heard about victims of modern slavery and trafficking being deported. I think there was a, a report last October um, for uh, uh, nearly 5,000 victims identified, only um, around 500 adults, 28 children given the right to remain over the last four years. So what happens to the others? You know, we've heard about um, people being deported for... Um, uh, so actually, for, when they report crimes that have happened against them, they've been living undocumented in the UK, they become the victim of a crime, domestic abuse, um, they report that crime and they, they're then, they're then um, at risk of deportation. So no wonder people are going to be reluctant to come forward and, and uh, report crimes against them. We've heard that people have been deported who are survivors of rape and torture. We've heard examples of um, severely ill hunger strikers being deported. Terminally ill hospital patients have been deported. I remember the case of Arma Sumani. She was deported, I think it was 2008, under a Labour government, shamefully. The, the Lancet called that case atrocious barbarism. And we've heard about homeless people. I think since 2016, you've been eligible. They've been eligible for, for deportation. It's been challenged in the courts. Um, the Home Office wants to persist with it. Um, and people who cannot prove that they're here legally. 
Um, you know, they, many of them have been deported illegally. The, the Windrush uh, ge generation, particularly egregious examples here, the Home Office made, made mistakes. They were deported. Some have since died. And then there are the category of the so-called foreign national offenders. Um, much lied about in the press, you know, they, they will tell you that everyone who is in that category is a dangerous, violent offender. Well, we've heard from Joan, we've heard that Azim is not a danger, he is in danger. These are many of the people who committed minor crimes, who may not have actually committed any crimes, who are victims of miscarriages of justice, which, um, as we all know, happens to racialise people in the criminal justice system. Um, people have been deported for non-custodial convictions if their offences are considered persistent. With Operation Nexus, people have been deported on the basis of no conviction at all. Contact with the police can be enough. Some of these people have been acquitted. Um, alleged gang involvement is enough. And um, again, foreign people, no, sorry, people who've lived all their lives here. It's possible to be deported to a country where you've never been, where you've only lived in early childhood, where you have no connection. So um, we really got to think beyond the headlines, you know, who is being deported and why. Um, and again, returning to the point about people being better than their governments, um, the hostile environment can only really survive in the darkness. Once people see what is happening, they do start to object. Um, it, it is really impressive that 348,000 people have signed the petition, more than that now, have signed the petition for Azim. Um, and um, Arthur Jones spoke bravely about Asim's case on uh, Victoria Darvish's programme on TV. I, I looked at the responses to that on, on Twitter and, uh, and these are people who may not be very you know, aware of all the case law, they might not know much about the hostile environment, but they listen to Jones speaking about her son and they're, they're saying, this is barbaric, this is just wrong, poor boy, this is hardly believable how mad, how embarrassing it is, it is who we are now. Why is he being deported if his mum is here? How is this right? Whatever happened to helping and supporting young people? I left England when I was 12, one man wrote, you know, this, this kid is way more English than I'll ever be. It's just cruel. How can we help? And I, that, I think it's really important to bear that in mind too, because um, I think sometimes politicians are scared to speak on these issues because of a, their, you know, imagined voter you know, they might be imagining a, a you know, put it bluntly, a, a racist voter out there who is not going to be receptive. Well, um, no, we, we've got to actually start cutting through because once people see what's actually happening, they understand the reality of the situation, then many of them will um, will prove to be far, far better than, their, than the government and, and actually, you know, than the opposition. And people are asking, you know, what can be done about this? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I know it's been raised in the chat already that a lot of people have contacted their, their Labour MPs about Asim. Um, and I've got um, a couple of Labour MPs on the panel who have been fantastic about this. We um, should mention that. We should mention that 68 MPs of all parties have signed an EDM now, I think, about this case. Still, 68 is a small number. Um, a lot of people have contacted their MPs and got, got a generic letter back. Um, letter says, I'm aware of the situation. I appreciate this must be a difficult time for Mr. Brown and his family. I cannot comment on individual cases, basically. Our Parliament does not have the power to intervene in court decisions. We keep watching the case. And obviously, you know, if they are going to keep monitoring the case, that's good. If they're aware of the case and sympathetic, that's good. But we want to know what more can be done. So I think it'd be interesting to hear more from our MP guests as to what we can do perhaps to put pressure on some of your colleagues to be a bit more active, to show real opposition, real solidarity with people in the seniors position. Um, and obviously in the um, Q&A, which we'll come to, really good to hear from you about how we can build a movement um, of labour activists, grassroots labour activists against these deportations. We've been having some ideas, some discussions on the steering committee about this, um, you know, how we can work with existing campaigns, maybe set up local action groups on these issues, maybe build a network of MPs who are going to amplify these um, cases in Parliament, um, how we can challenge labour policy, change labour policy at conference level, because, you know, Sadly, um, Labour governments have quite a, you know, quite a, a bad record on this and we, we want to make sure we're never in that position again. We want to um, work with trade unions to build resistance, maybe even build, working with workers who are involved in the infrastructure of the hostile environment, you know, within airlines, uh, who, can actually be in, who might be in a position to do something about that, persuade their colleagues not to be complicit in these deportations. So there's a lot more that we can do um, and it'd be really interesting to hear more from you um, about how we can take that forward together. Thank you. Emma, you've just muted yourself. Hi, uh, yeah, that's 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 me done.
Okay, thank you so much, Emma, and really pertinent points that you've raised there about um, Labour's record on this and that it's not enough for us to just say that we are um, the party of equality or the party of anti-racism. I think far more accurate would be to say that we're a party with anti-racists in it and we need to make sure that we're, we're challenging the hostile environment and doing everything that we can to dismantle it from within Parliament as well as giving a voice to the movements that are doing it um, outside. So thank you so much for that, Emma. I'm going to jump to Apsana now. I know that Apsana has been held up in the chamber, so has come as soon as she can. Apsana is the Labour MP for Poplar and Limehouse and has been a real supporter of free movement and migrants' rights, both outside Parliament and also now as an MP. Over to you, Apsana. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that warm welcome and greetings to everybody on this call and everybody that's watching. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak. I um, wanted to say really a few things. I mean, firstly, that the treatment of Azima Brown is a grave misjustice and goes against the concept of natural justice. He's been tried by a court, he's served his time, and that should be enough. And to punish him further undermines the entire judicial system. And threatening a vulnerable person with deportation is a disgrace. He's being risked being sent to a country where he has no family support and no support network. Now, the, the Home Office's deportation orders are deeply unjust, not just in this case, but they are wrong in every single instance. And that's what I wanted to sort of make clear today as well. The system exists to further penalise people of colour who are already overrepresented in the criminal justice system and, you know, who receive uh, comparatively harsher sentences compared to their white peers. So, you know, it, it's overwhelmingly clear for me that people of colour um, receive and experience uh, this form of double, double jeopardy. Uh, where they risk not only incarceration when they commit a crime, but they also face the, the threat of losing their homes, families and, and support systems. Um, and, you know, how long we live in a country is not important. Uh, the severity of our crimes or the vulnerability of our situations um, are clearly not important in their eyes. And many like Asima have no ties to the countries which they've been deported to, and many are forced to leave uh, families and children behind in this country. So the, the current policies uh, reveal the deeply ingrained uh, racism in our government, the structural racism that's embedded in government policies, where people of colour are never truly seen as fully fledged and equal participating citizens. Um, so the, the deportation order has to absolutely be rescinded in this case, and the Home Office needs to uh, end its, you know, really deep and unjust policy on, on deportations. Up until that point, um, we have to continue to shine a light on uh, CMA's case for him and, and for others like him, and we mustn't, um, we must sort of fight against every single uh, deputation fight um, and continue the campaign to end the hostile environment. And with that, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I'll, I'll keep working with, with fantastic colleagues uh, to, to, to do that in Parliament. Thank you. Thank you so much, Apsana. And those were, were really powerful words. I'd echo absolutely everything that you said. Lastly, we're going to hear from Luke de Noronha. Um, Luke, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, I have a lot that I've written down to say, so I'll try and speed through it. But I was asked to kind of give a bit of context for some of the legislation, um, which actually Emma's done really well. So I'll probably zoom over some of it. But I think it's worth briefly giving a history of, because what we're talking about and have been talking about recently in both the Seams case and in the cases around the charter flights to Jamaica, which have caused a kind of set of campaigns, has been the deportation of so-called foreign criminals um, which be, or, or foreign national offenders, which began in 2006 with the foreign national prisoner crisis. And so uh, for, given the audience, I thought some people might be interested in, um, in being signposted to that history, a kind of inglorious history of the Labour Party in the mid noughties um, when Charles Clark was sacked as Home Secretary after the foreign national prisoner crisis and John Reid came in promising to be even more tough 
on asylum seekers and migrants. Um, at a time, you know, when asylum seekers had been subject to demonization in, in an intense way that, that actually is, you know, even worse than we're seeing now in some ways. There were um, brutal attacks on rights for all migrants. 7-7 um, seven, seven had just happened the year before, so Tony Blair was under a lot of pressure from the tabloids. You know, Gordon Brown comes in a year later and says British jobs for British workers, basically echoing the National Front. And it's in that year, in 2007, when the UK Borders Act is brought in, which has the policy of automatic deportation, which means that anyone with a sentence of 12 months, the Home Office will automatically pursue their deportation. That standard as threshold has been lowered and lowered, but it's still the baseline, really, that for a lot of these cases, like it seems. And there have been various changes to the rules, various cuts to legal aid, various attacks on the, on the ways in which people can access justice and appeal rights, but ultimately, the kind of foundation for the, the increase in the number of people with records deported was then. And it increased about fivefold and it stayed around that number, about five to 6,000 since every year um, with an increasing number actually of EU migrants over the last few years. I also saw a lot of foreign nationals held post criminal sentence. So after you serve your criminal sentence being held under immigration powers, under administrative law, and actually uh, a lot of the detention organizations campaigning against in the UK's policy of indefinite detention. We're the only country in the EU, no longer in the EU, we're the only European state to have indefinite detention, no time limit. And some of the people who were actually held the longest are always those with criminal records. Um, we also saw prisons reorganized around the question of nationality. We now have foreign national only prisons um, where everyone in, incarcerated under criminal law is foreign national in places like Huntercombe in Oxfordshire, and I think it's Maidstone in Kent. Um, and this all leads the, leads the way to the kinds of policies we're seeing more recently. The hostile environment is a broader set of policies, a very brutal and cruel set of policies designed to kind of spectacularly punish migrants. Uh, and we will all remember David Cameron and Theresa May joining an immigration raid around the time that she first said that she'd create a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. Um, and also broad attacks on human rights. The reason I think this political history is important is because for those who remember Theresa May as Home Secretary, um, though it's not a pleasant set of memories, but it's ones that we should return to if we want to understand these deportations. When she did that story about the person who was able to stay because of their relationship with a cat, which was totally untrue, but she did it. And she also said, we'll deport foreign criminals first and hear their appeals later. This was all kind of, a, you know, kind of, um, signaling to people like Richard Littlejohn and Daily Mail readers that we were being really tough on migration and tough on crime and that, that it was the EU and it was liberal judges and it was human rights and now it's kind of lefty lawyers and activist lawyers that were getting in the way of Britain's kind of racist common sense. We all know what we need, which is just to deport the foreigners back home. Um, and that's important because in, I think it's an important and under, understated reason, partly of the justification for Brexit. The foreign criminals we can't deport because the EU human rights get in the way was a real key trope and one that really was quite important, I think, to the campaign um, to leave. And, it, and we, it remains to be seen what the Tory party will do with the human rights law. Um, so that's part of the history. And then of course, there's a longer history too, to the history of immigration control. And I wanna put it very simply, the history of immigration control is a history of racism. As has been mentioned already, the 1905 Aliens Act was the first piece of modern immigration legislation, which was a direct response to the arrival of Jews from Eastern Europe who were escaping persecution. And I found a, a quote here from a Manchester Evening Chronicle in 1905, which wrote, that the dirty, destitute, diseased, verminous and criminal foreigner who dumps himself on our soil and rates simultaneously shall be forbidden to land. And this sounds to me very much like it could have been written by Katie Hopkins, but it's been written 115 years ago by someone arguing for the first immigration legislation. So from the very beginning, immigration law has been about a response to racist resentment, to racial fears, to fears about the racial stock stated in quite eugenic terms both in 1905 and in the post-war years when the now now um, in favor wind apparently in favor windrush migrants were arriving so i don't want to go over that history too much i mean for those who are interested in the history of post-war migration settlement racist immigration my friend and colleague nadine elanani's recent book bordering britain is a good place to start um, but I'm not, I'm not going to go through that anymore. I suppose the important lesson I want to draw out is that when we recognise this history, the immigration controls have always been mobilised by racist resentment, 
whether against Jews, Asians and African Caribbeans or asylum seekers who were especially racialized as Muslim or Roma and Eastern European migrants. Um, the implication from thinking, from, from acknowledging that immigration controls have always been about racist resentment and racial fears is that we can't think about racism and migration in isolation. And we've had the really important point made uh, that I will echo that, that workers' struggles are also migrant struggles, but also more broadly, I want to say that all anti-racist struggles should be about challenging all immigration restrictions. This is important because there's a temptation, I think, for black and brown British citizens to be seduced by promises of, of representation and inclusion in the nation. We have, after all, the most diverse cabinet at the moment that we may have had currently running the most authoritarian right-wing regime. So we have to be cautious about these kinds of uh, seductions of a multicultural Britain that includes us and avoid um, the politics of, of, and I'm speaking here particularly about racialized black and brown British citizens, not falling into the trap of saying, don't call me a migrant. I've been here for a long time. I'm British and my hardships have nothing to do with those of Polish rough sleepers or Eritrean asylum seekers. They are not me, which I think we saw a bit with the Windrush scandal. To be honest, I think we saw a folding in of one group of migrants into the national citizenry um, and a very clear distancing of them from people defined as illegal immigrants. And if you go back and read David Lammy's comment pieces in The Guardian, for example, you'll see that very clearly, that point made. These, you need to understand these are citizens, they are not illegal immigrants, which is a very dead end and limited politics for an anti-racist um, movement or for anti-racist within the Labour Party, which I think is a good framing. Okay. Um, I'll skip through a bit of hate I'd written about Priti Patel because we all know the nightmare we're currently living through and I'll just I'll, I'll try and talk a bit about strategies and resistance because I was asked to talk a bit about my thoughts on some on some strategies and what might work. So as I've said we need to connect our struggles against racism in school play, schools and workplaces or the criminal justice system to a broad struggle against violent immigration controls. And the struggle against racism or anti-racist movements will be strengthened by, by censoring migrants and migrant rights, just as migrant rights will be much strengthened by a politics of anti-racism rather than a kind of liberal politics of saving individuals or special pleading. Um, we should, I mean, the point's been made much better than I can make it by Becky, than I can make it by Becky, which was about including migrants with precarious status in union organizing the challenges you face both within unions, but also just being up against it when people don't have legal rights. Um, but I think we've seen the independent unions trying to do some of this work as well and doing it well, although I'm not an expert. I think really that fight is an important one. But it's also important to remember that migrant struggles are not only about workers, but also about those excluded from work, either formally by their migration status or informally by the fact that they're, ex they're excluded from the labor market because of racism or class oppression or criminal records. And so because we're talking about the deportation of people who've been criminalized today, I think we need to think what our line is on crime and criminal justice, which is really important. Um, so rather than saying that, you know, this individual is not really a criminal, we need to try and make the broader argument that law and order policing and building of prisons is a deliberate and right wing policy that locks away, that seeks to lock away social problems and blame individuals for their survival strategies. Um, and here I'm thinking especially of the ways in which people are locked up, people who sell drugs, for example, and drug policy. And many of the people I met in Jamaica who'd been deported were, were convicted of drugs offenses. That's the most common reason. We need to think about why individuals sell drugs and what, where they fit structurally. We need to say again and again that prisons are a form of torture, which do not fix social problems, but worsen them. They don't solve drug misuse, gross social inequality, or interpersonal and especially gendered violence. We need to say and always say that criminals are not a human type, but might be better thought of in terms of uh, as a, a kind of segment of the working or oppressed classes, i.e. mostly young men from poor, poor and racialized communities in particular areas, urban areas and particular areas of cities. And to remember that a criminal record is a kind of state classification that does the opposite work to say a degree certificate from an elite university. So the point I'm making here is that we should be really critical of the criminal justice system in general. Um, of course, we are in individual cases, we, we tell stories and it's important to do that. And we, we challenge the Home Office when they say that everyone on this flight is a serious criminal. But there's always a difficulty with, with what, not trying to kind of shift the goalposts, but to say something um, more broadly about protection of people from deportation, but also against 
the logic of police and prisons fixing problems that they never fix and they don't keep us safe. Okay. Um, and in terms of strategy, I'm just going to say a couple more things and then I'll finish. Firstly, I think public cam campaigns like the Asim Brown campaign are really, really important. I think storying these cases is really important and it's what I've tried to do in my, my own writing. I think they can really shift public opinion. I was invited onto One Extra, for example, in the wake of Asim's case, and that, that wouldn't have happened without the kind of story behind it. And I was able to share some of the wider context that I'm sharing now. We need to build them, build the individual campaigns and then build out from them, which I think is what this event is about. For people within the Labour Party, I think uh, we need to create real pressure and policy plans for what a Labour government would do differently. For example, under the Corbyn government, um, there were claims about closing detention centres, only two detention centres, which, which had had panorama programmes on, not all of them, but still it was something. Stop charter flights. Um, and I think we should be arguing for human rights, for the Human Rights Act and securing access to justice and bringing back legal aid. Um, I think we, we also need to recognise that direct action has a big influence. Stansted 15, for example, who prevented a charter flight going to West Africa, really influenced Labour policy under Corbyn and Diana, but actually with their promises to end charter flights, which clearly emerged out of the Stansted 15 case. Um, legal actions are very important. Most deportation cases that you'll see in, in the kinds of ones that we campaign over in, in a lot of the charter flight cases would have had a good chance at appeal with decent lawyers, with legal aid, with time. So we need to demand uh, access to justice, fundamental rights, legal aid. And these things are important as well because they move beyond just shifting the goalpost to include particular special groups like Windrush migrants or those who were born here and they move away from just individual cases, they kind of demand that we raise the ground for everyone, the base level of rights, um, which would make a big difference for a lot of the individuals for whom campaigns are not the right strategy for all sorts of personal individual reasons. Um, so, so that's really important to make good old kind of liberal arguments really for, for, for human rights and access to justice. In campaigns, I think we need to avoid the good migrant and bad migrant game avoid saying that this individual is not a real criminal, avoid saying that Windrush migrants are not illegal or that refugees are not criminals. Ultimately, we need to explode the legal and administrative categories which produce some people as criminals, others as victims of persecution, others as workers or spouses or just as students, which is what migration law does, fix people in these categories. We need to explode them with the full humanity and complexity of the real people, ideally in struggle, that we share our lives with and not double down and reinvest in them. Okay, and finally, we should rem remember those are radical arguments about, about crime and remember that it's bad policy that makes criminals, not bad people. We should seek to build a bold, strong and dynamic anti-racist movement, which will always exceed the Labour Party and which seeks to support migrant rights, reduce the remit of the police and prisons to include people without British citizenship in the struggle and which returns to the 70s and 80s, 1970s and 1980s radical anti-racist politics, which knew that when they said send them back, they were talking about all of us. Um, I'll leave it there. Sorry if I went too fast. No, not at all, Luke. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, I think it's particularly important to make that point in the context of the criminal justice system and what makes that so unjust but also what brings about crime in the first place and I completely agree with you that um, it's important not to look for reasons to show that this particular individual is an exception to the rule but rather show that the whole rule is flawed and inhumane and brutal which I think is something that all of us can bear in mind and in particular politicians where we're sort of forced backed into that corner sometimes. Um, so thank you so much for that, Luke. We've got quite a few comments and questions in the chat. So, but in between other things, so please bear with me while I retrieve them. It wouldn't let me copy and paste the questions into a separate document. So I've just got to keep scrolling. Um, We had a question from Aish. I hope that I'm pronouncing your name properly. You're organising the Twitter storm for a theme on Sundays. 
at 7 p.m. and have asked where um, you should be focusing your efforts on Twitter. And also, um, we don't seem to be getting anywhere with writing to MPs because they replied that they can't comment while the appeal's ongoing. I've now asked people to write directly to the Home Office and various ministers within that department. It'd be great to hear your thoughts. Um, well, I'll put that back to the panel. Before I do, I think from my perspective, it's important to target Tory MPs, but also Labour MPs who, who should be on board with this. Um, it is the case that the subjudice rule means that we can't speak about cases by name in the chamber while, while they're going through appeals, but that can easily be worked around. So for example, a few months ago, I raised in the chamber and directly challenged the justice secretary to stop deportations of neurodivergent individuals in the criminal justice system and to urgently undertake a review. Um, and that was, of course, talking about Azeem's case, but without mentioning him. Um, I think also in communications with Labour MPs, and I think this relates to something that Despina has said in the chat as well, saying that, um, that Labour's manifestos haven't been um, watertight on migrants' rights, which I think most of us would agree with, um, but also remembering that it is Labour Party conference decided policy that we would shut down not just the two detention centres that get a lot of coverage, but that all detention centres should be shut down, that um, free movement should be defended and extended, and lots of policies that are more radical than current Labour policy, and it's, it's incumbent on all of us to keep up the pressure for that. But let me let me put those questions back to our panel. Um, who'd like to go first? Hello, Graham. I know that um, Apsana can't be here now, but she posted an answer in the chat, um, I think, on what to do if your MP isn't, isn't um, so helpful. And, and she suggests inviting them to a meeting like this or to an MP's briefing meeting. I'd also suggest asking them to attend a meeting of the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs. We can build on the coordinating actions. Some MPs taking leads on particular parts of the wider campaign through their letters, press, written questions. Also for other cases, like it seems, supporting MPs with other cases, amplify them as champions for particular constituents, concentrating energy. Oh, Emma, you've just muted yourself. Sorry. Still muted. Yeah, you're still muted. Try. Yeah, got you. Hi, did, did you get that? Uh, did you get that last answer at all? I got part of it, but then you went on mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I think I think I, um, it was just basically Absana beg and a suggestion on how you might um, work in the, with the MPs, um, get, getting them to focus on particular cases could, um, where they can act as champions of particular constituents, she says, but also inviting them to briefing meetings. Like, like this one, um, and maybe when they hear their stories directly, then they might be more receptive. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good suggestion from Apsana, and I'm certainly happy to to coordinate a um, a meeting with the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs, which I'm also a member of. Luke, Joan, Becky, do you have? Any comments that you'd like to make about this or anything else that you've seen in the chat? And in the meantime, I'll scroll and look for another question or comment. I mean, I can see a couple of questions which came up 
in response to me saying something about the the Labour Party under Corbyn, and then there's also a question also from um, the same person about the anti-racist politics of the 70s and 80s being against the Labour Party. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not in, in the Labour Party and I don't really have a line on, on what anti-racist relationship to it should be. I think important work can be done within and against the Labour Party. I feel like under Corbyn, there were different options. There were still a lot of bad, bad suggestions about more prisons and more police and more and more um, more border guards, as you point out. But there was also openings, I felt, and this group is one such that, I, as far as I understand, emerges out of some of those openings in an attempt to change. And as you talk about conference, which I which I've not been to, um, so I think that those questions are fair enough. But I think there's a lot of people, even in the 70s and 80s, for example, who would have seen. Um, who would have seen opportunities to work in against um, and for a less bad opposition party or a less bad incumbent party? I don't think that's necessarily, I don't think that you, we have to be pure necessarily. Thanks for that, Luke. Um, ben makes a good point in the chat that um, what Labour Party conference passed is Labour Party policy um, and anything else is contradicting that policy. So it's it's important for um, for us to be applying pressure on um, on the party and on members of parliament to to uphold that policy and to advocate for it. Um, I think David Landau has his hand raised, so I'll move to you David thank you you're on mute David yeah it's if I'm muted now oh dear hello yeah, I can hear you now I can hear you right now. Okay. yeah just just a couple of things really um just to say I'm David Lando and I'm was one of the founder members of something called the no one is illegal manifesto group which was the kind of cousin of um of uh, campaign against in immigration controls, um, which uh, which which um, uh, Becky talked about, um, and in fact there, there were three conferences. There was conference in Liverpool and in Manchester uh, by No One Is Illegal, and what No One Is Illegal was about really in the first instance was dealing with all sorts of comrades in the fights around particular cases but who had the idea or, or argued for things like fair immigration controls and non-racist immigration controls. And our whole emphasis was on saying, there's no such thing. You can't, you can't have, the, because the, these controls are about there being people who you exclude because, or criminalize because of their, um, their, where they were born, where their parents were born, language they speak, what values they embrace and so on. Um, so by definition, you can't have fair non-racist immigration controls. And that was kind of where we were coming from. Um, just a few, but positives and negatives in history. The TUC actually came out very badly in the, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, saying that um, uh, they came out for the Aliens Act for controls, but as it got closer to that being implemented, some train, trades councils, particularly London and Manchester, rebelled and said, "No, um, we we we're, we're against this." But it was too 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 short, too late. Um, but struggles inside these movements obviously are important. Um, I think I'll stop. <laughs> Various things I've listed to, to say, but. Um, Good to see Be Becky again after all these years, and um, and to say that um, I assume that when you're talking about a working group, um, that's I would like to be involved in that. Does that include people outside the Labour Party as well as inside the Labour Party? Because I know it's a a Labour Party campaign uh, uh, um, um, for free movement. So just wanted to clarify that because I would be very happy to be part of that working group. Thank you so much, David. It's 
deliberately called the Labour campaign for free movement and not the Labour Party campaign for free movement so that people in the wider Labour movement can be involved. And thank you for coming along because you're such a, a giant of the socialist, internationalist and anti-borders movement and just very concisely there highlighted some of the struggles that have existed within our, our own movements. Um, I'm going to bring in next John McDonnell, who, well, he needs no introduction, but on Asim Brown's case, John has been extremely supportive and we've been working together on this in Parliament. So over to you, John. Josh, are you able to let John speak? How's that? Yeah, 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 we've got you. Okay, sorry I'm so late. I've, I've been at the campaign group. I'm sorry about that. It went on a bit longer. Um, I, I suppose that I'm just here to express solidarity with the overall campaign for Seamen and obviously offer to do whatever we, we can. Um, uh, having not heard the discussion so far, I think there's three issues for me. One is on a serious individual case, I think there's a hell of a lot of support. Um, and every time you explain the case and what's happened to people, it's almost automatic that we get the support. And so therefore, I think the work that's been done so far by people campaigning, a serious family, etc., has been absolutely... So we just have to now bring that to a, to a conclusion so that we gain the security of not having this threat continuing on. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, uh, with a, on, for me, it does also um, throw up the whole issue with regard to neurodiversity as well um, and the way in which um, there's a lack of recognition of neurodiversity within our community. And just to say in the last four years, the development of a neurodiversity manifesto, I think was really a fundamental breakthrough and we mustn't let that work go to waste. And we've got to drive it through from, from us who are Labour Party members, we've got to drive it through the Labour Party to make sure it's adhered to and then delivered in government. And the third thing as well, just to follow, I caught the tail end of the last discussion. Um, the whole debate about immigration has got to be reopened again, much more fundamentally. Um, I was involved in the discussion around no borders, um, what was this, 10 years ago. And actually, although that provoked a reaction, it did open up a, re a real discussion and debate about the nature of the society that we want and where do we go from here? I actually think we've gone backwards rather than forwards. So that's why the discussion around free movement and open borders is fundamental to the way in which we lay the foundations for the discussion of a sort of society that we want in the future. And that's challenging in the current political climate with the government that we've got and the media that we've got. But I don't, I don't think we should shy away from it anymore. I think we should take it head on and have a proper discussion about where we go from here. And I actually do think we'll, we'll find a wider range of support across the labor and trade union movement in the, its broadest sense than some people think at the moment. Anyway, I, I, again, apologies for, for being so late, but I called in not to speak, just to be present in solidarity. John, thank you so much. And thank you for the decades of work that you've done speaking up on issues of of migrants' rights and borders outside the labour movement, but also within it. Um, a message from Aish, again, I, I really hope that I've got your name right. Um, can you please remind everyone of the Twitter storm on Sunday at 7, 7 p.m., every Sunday at 7 p.m. until we get justice for a seam. The hashtag is hashtag justice for a seam brown. Um, and they've been very successful so far, been 7,000 odd tweets in around three hours um, last week. So please do join in that on Twitter. Um, 
or if there's more questions here. Oh, is, would Rosie like to speak? Yes, please. Over to you, Rosie. Okay, hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Yeah, no, can hear you fine. Okay, because I, I, I can only see you, Nadia. Um, so I'm Rosie Newbigy, I'm from Bedford and Kempston Labour Party. Um, we send solidarity to the Seam Brown campaign. Uh, we passed the motion last Friday and we've donated, we're donating a hundred pounds to the campaign. So um, just brilliant, everybody that's involved in it and, and solidarity, particularly to Asimi and his family. Um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes just talking very briefly uh, about the campaign to stop the expansion of Yarlswood Immigration Removal Centre. Um, so about five miles from where I'm sitting now is the notorious Yarlswood Immigration Removal Centre. Uh, it was sadly opened under a, a new Labour government in 2001. It's been beset by scandals, including a fire, suicide, uh, self-harm, uh, a hunger strike, uh, a couple of hunger strikes, uh, the, the most recent of which was only three years ago. Um, and in 2015, the Chief Inspector of Prisons um, referred to it as a place of national concern. Uh, despite allegations of abuse by Serco staff towards uh, female detainees, um, Serco had a multi-million pound contract renewed and the Home Office now has a plan uh, to expand Yarlswood by placing uh, up to 200 people seeking asylum on wasteland within the Yarlswood estate and putting people in porter cabins. Um, so there's a big campaign going on to try to stop this horrible, horrible plan. Um, and uh, it's got a number of dimensions, um, uh, one of which is, is a legal challenge. So I have sent, um, I've been working closely with uh, some lawyers from Duncan Lewis, and um, I've sent a letter in my name, uh, letter before action um, to the Home Secretary and also to the Bedford Borough Council, because that's the planning authority. Um, we're challenging it on, on three grounds. One is that we believe, our lawyers believe it's unlawful because the Home Office has invoked uh, emergency measures under the Town and Country Planning Act. And we don't believe that it's an emergency. We think there are alternatives. There are thousands of empty hotel rooms. There's empty hall of residence. Uh, there are half a million empty properties in the country. We also don't think there's been a proper environmental impact assessment done. And also there's been no consultation under the Public Sector Duty Act with regards to the impact on community relations. Um, we're also concerned that although we're being told that people in the camp will be free to come and go, um, actually there will be a curfew, which we believe amounts to false imprisonment. Uh, there will be a curfew at night. And if you've ever been to Yarlswood, as I have many times to visit people, um, it is the most desolate place. It is stuck in the middle of nowhere. When you're going up there, you just feel like you're driving to the end of the world. It is miserable. And Yarlswood Immigration Removal Centre and the Home Office say that the, the camp will be completely separate. Uh, you know, it is the equivalent of a Category B prison. It feels like a prison when you go in there. And it's, it's just a horrible, horrible place. Um, and there's huge anxiety that people that are, you know, in the camp may, if, if, if asylum claims uh, are not successful, may be uh, escalated up to um, the main immigration removal centre. So we believe that the Home Office plan has to be stopped. Uh, we're taking legal action. We're looking at, through Nadia, getting an early day motion in uh, Mohammed Yassin, the MP for Bedford and Kempston, um, has already asked questions in the House of Commons. Uh, we've had a fair bit of press coverage um, and it's been supportive and sympathetic. Um, and, and we're obviously hoping that we can stop this. So um, we haven't had a, a full response from the Home Office to our letter before action. They've asked for an extension. Uh, what we have, I think, been able to achieve is, is, is stalling the Home Office plans. And obviously there is a lot of pressure on the Home Office uh, uh, and Home Secretary at the moment with regard to the way in which, you know, it would appear over the last 
over the last period of time, there has been a hardening in terms of the attitude of uh, the, the, the Home Office, the Home Secretary towards the treatment of people seeking asylum. You know, people are probably aware, I've, I've only just joined the call in the last five minutes, so I don't know if this has already been discussed, but um, the way in which people are being treated at, at, at the, the army barracks uh, in Wales, at Penali, Napier in Kent, uh, and, and also in, in Norfolk is, is shameful. Um, and you're probably aware that there was a protest, that there has been a protest at Napier where people, people, asylum seekers have been actually sleeping outside rather than sleep inside the barracks. And there have been uh, incidents of uh, attempted suicide and self-harm and huge concern, uh, an outbreak of COVID. So I'll just pause there. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I mean, it's all part of this horrible, hostile environment, which we absolutely have to have to end. Um, so, so happy to take any questions, but thank you. Thank you, Nadia and Josh for the opportunity to speak. No, that's a really important contribution, Rosie. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to hand over in the final minute to Joan, Osim's mum, um, just to say a final few words for people to, to be left with, and then we'll close the meeting promptly at seven o'clock. Over to you, Joan. Okay, thank you so much, um, Nadia, and thanks for having me today. Um, it's just two things I really want to say, what I would like to see out of um, seem, um, this campaign and all this ordeal that we are going through. You know, we, we as a family and even I know other people need this, do we need a new law around police and investigation and accountability? Because we as um, the black community, we have the lowest confidence in the police and we need that to change. And also I need a judicial review into my son case. And that is what I want. And not only my son, for other scenes out there, because there's a lot of scenes out there that doesn't have a voice, you know, afraid to come forward. But sometimes I just want to say to them, don't be afraid. I was like you until I said enough is enough. And when it comes to your children or your child, you will do anything for them because I'm a hands on mom and I will do anything for my baby, anything. So thank you for having me today. Thank you. Joan, thank you so much and for, for leaving us with those extremely powerful words. I just urge everybody to sign the petition, to share it, to get involved with the Twitter campaign. And if you're possibly able to, to donate via the link that's in the chat. Thanks very much for coming, everyone. Good night.